thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, I really want to thank all of you who decided to stay to the very end for the very last day to hear the last few presentations. So I hope to make this presentation worth it for you to have stayed to the last day. Um, as you already heard, I am the rapporteur for the E11A guideline and I come from FDA. And I'm very happy to be here to give you some insights on the recently published draft guideline as well as a case example to hope, I hope to illustrate to you how the guideline can be used. So this is my disclosure and acknowledgement slide. I have nothing to disclose. Of course, the, um, the uh, talk represents my views and not necessarily the views of the FDA, the organization whom I represent. And I do want to thank two of my colleagues from the E11A working group, Andrew Thompson and Skip Nelson, for their contributions to this talk. The other thing I want to uh, mention is that this is a little bit of a homecoming for me. I was actually lived in Seoul for one year, uh, way back 30 years ago. Um, I was in the US Army and I was uh, stationed at uh, Yongsan uh, at the 121 Army Hospital. So I'm very happy to be back. So if we start on the talk, I want to give you a little bit of history about pediatric extrapolation so that it gives you some context in understanding the current guideline. So those of you who are familiar with pediatric drug development will know about this concept, pediatric extrapolation. But don't worry, if you don't understand or not involved in pediatric drug development, this will help to explain to you why this is a relevant topic uh, related to what you do in drug development. Pediatric extrapolation was first presented as a concept, as an idea, in 1994, so almost 30 years ago, uh, when we didn't know how to develop drugs for children. But the idea was, and FDA said, well, if we think about pediatrics and children and how they relate to adult drug development, we suppose that if you get a drug developed and approved in adults, that if there are similarities between that disease in adults compared to children, and if there are similarities between how the drug might respond in an adult compared to a child, then maybe we can leverage some of the adult data to help support the approval in children. That's the whole concept of extrapolation, whether you use it in pediatrics or whether you use it for biosimilars or whether you use it for uh, pharmaco, um, a bioequivalence. It's extracting information that you know and applying it to a situation in which you don't know. Importantly, at that time, as I mentioned, we didn't know that extrapolation could even be used because we weren't sure that a pediatric drug development program could actually be successful 30 years ago. It was not really well established that you could do clinical trials in children 30 years ago. So importantly, as part of this, I'm going to use my pen here, um, th that in fact, at that time, dosing and safety could not necessarily be fully extrapolated. In other words, you were always going to need to get some information on safety and dosing in children. So if we look at the history between 1994 and the present day, you can see by this slide that a lot has happened in pediatric therapeutics development. Not only are there now laws in the US and the EU that help to encourage and also to require studies, but we've written a couple of guidances now in ICH that help to explain drug development. And now in 2017, as you can see here, the E11A working group was established. And in 2022, just in April, about four years, took us a little while because of the pandemic, we have the draft guideline published. During this 20 year period, there have been great advances in development of drugs for children. We've learned a lot. And therefore, we wanted to present a guideline that includes that evolution. So in, in addition to understanding more about how drugs can be developed in children, we also have gained a lot of knowledge in understanding how to design trials in children and also to use information that we've already gained to make those trial designs more feasible. The E11R1, which was that original guideline, um, describes a lot of the basics for drug development, but this E11A guideline amplifies and increases and goes into more detail about the use of pediatric extrapolation. This slide is a very busy slide and you don't need to read it, okay? 
All it me I mean to tell you is that in our original way of thinking, when FDA first talked about extrapolation back in 1994, the early 2000s, we thought about extrapolation and basically you could do it in three ways. Either you could fully extrapolate or you could partially extrapolate information or there was no ability to extrapolate. There were really only three ways you could extrapolate, fully, partially, or none. But the EMA came out with a reflection paper on pediatric extrapolation about 10 years later. So this was you know, early to mid-2000s to 2017. And EMA noticed here, remove that concept of full extrapolation or categories of extrapolation. Because EMA said, you know, really what we want to do is establish an extrapolation concept. What do we know? What do we not know? And then to develop a plan based on answering those unknowns. So this notion of categorization of extrapolation uh, was changed with the EMA reflection paper. And so by 2017 and moving forward with the, with the evolution of pediatric extrapolation was the formation of the EWG, the E11A expert working group. And you can see here this picture includes many of the folks who um, are, are, are um, convening again finally since the pandemic for the first time. This picture was taken in 2019, November, our last face-to-face -face meeting in Singapore. And many of us are uh, again uh, um, uh, gathered together again to meet for the first time in three years. Uh, the goal of the working group in this, for this guideline included really three important concepts in this guideline. To align the terminology around extrapolation, to provide a systematic approach, and then to describe the types of statistical methodology, study designs, modeling, and simulation that can be used as part of an extrapolation approach. And I hope to present to you in the case example, as well as a brief overview of the guideline, that we've met all of these three objectives. Here's a table of contents. What I want to put forth to you here is not a detailed description of the table of contents. In fact, you can download the guideline and read it yourself. But what we put forth here is this new framework for thinking about extrapolation, including the concept, the plan, and some additional pediatric considerations. However, I don't want this to be buried. The other thing that we mentioned here is this newer concept of extrapolation of safety. Remember when I said back in 1994 that there wasn't this belief that you could extrapolate safety. But what we've recognized over time is that indeed you should be thinking about what information you already have that's available on the drug or that's used in different populations that can support um, leveraging that data and not necessarily completing a full adequate or full control trial just for safety. So in a nutshell, if you're thinking about pediatric extrapolation, again, we've moved away from the idea of full, partial, and none in this guideline. We want you to think about pediatric extrapolation as a concept and a plan. So the whole framework that we think about pediatric extrapolation is developing a concept, developing a plan, and then executing that plan. What is a pediatric extrapolation concept then? A concept simply includes basically four, four, four pieces here. What do we know? What do we know about the similarity of the disease between an adult reference population and the pediatric population we're gonna study? And what do we not know? What are, the, what are the uncertainties or what are the things that we, the gaps in knowledge? What models do we have that can help us to analyze, synthesize the data we've collected or the data that we have? And then ultimately, how similar are the diseases and the response to treatment in the populations? And the populations generally are the reference population or that adult population in whom you have information applied to the pediatric population the pediatric target population, whether it's the entire pediatric population from newborns all the way to adulthood, or maybe a segment of the population, maybe six to 17, or two to 17, or two to six, whatever population that you're gonna be studying in children. This slide is also quite busy, and it is also included in the guideline already. But the important component, the first piece to the extrapolation exercise and building a concept is, what data exist and how should we review them? And this is very important because what we're not talking about, many people think about this in the early days, that the only data that would exist are the clinical data that you've collected for a drug that you're studying in the adult condition, right? 
So I want to study um, a, a tumor necrosis factor in adult rheumatoid arthritis. So the only data I'll have is what I've collected in phase two, and I can see how that applies to children. No. In fact, what we're saying here is you should not only be thinking about data you're collecting at the time in the condition that you're studying in adults for that drug, but maybe there's clinical data in related conditions already approved, okay, that could be used uh, that have been studied for different drugs in the class. In addition, there may be clinical data, okay, for the same disease, but you're looking at different drugs. There may be non-clinical data from animal models that you can use. And here, importantly, we, we put forward the concept of the use of real-world data. So real-world data, uh, you know, the, the magic bullet for real-world data is that we can use it as an external control, and maybe you don't have to do a control trial. But here, the use of real-world data in developing a pediatric extrapolation concept is very important because you can use data from disease registries or electronic health records, claims databases that can help support that the diseases are similar between adult, adults and children. And then, of course, other sources, including you know, published, um, published data, meta-analyses, expert opinions, even standard of care can be used to help support uh, as, as uh, components of existing data. This slide also describes, remember I mentioned the three discrete categories and we've moved away. This describes the continuum of extrapolation from diseases that are different between adults and children to diseases that we consider to be the same. Drugs that behave differently in adults compared to children to the drug that actually we think behaves no differently in adult than a pediatric population. Then the evidence to support that similarity, you may have no data at all or large gaps of data or ultimately you may have lots of data and you have high confidence in that similarity. Based on this analysis then comes down to the development of the plan. And if you have different diseases, you don't have confidence that the drugs behave, will behave similarly, or you have large gaps in knowledge, that might require that you have to develop a program that, um, that uses independent substantiation of the effectiveness in children, i.e., that is adequate and well-controlled trials, placebo or active controlled, randomized uh, controlled trials. But if you have high confidence that the diseases are the same and you have lots of data to support that, then maybe what you can do is actually match an exposure. So identify a dose in the pediatric population that matches the exposure to the approved uh, dose in adults, right? Open label PK matching exercise with maybe the collection of some safety data. Or you could consider even enrolling children in the adult clinical trials. So you can see here that that may save a lot of time between adult approval and pediatric approval. This framework then is based on this conceptual framework that I've just presented. We decided to create sort of a procedural or process framework as well. So I mentioned disease similarity. Drug pharmacology is the drug similar, behaving similarly, and response to treatment. How does the drug behave in that specific disease? So these three pillars together, when you look at the similarities and differences, form the extrapolation concept. Once you have the concept formed, you know what you know, you know what you don't know, and you have to collect that data, you create an extrapolation plan where the objectives are to develop methodologies, investigations that will fill in those gaps in knowledge. Now, importantly, these arrows don't only go in one direction. In fact, sometimes you may need to collect additional information before you finalize the concept. And that additional information you collect will feed back into the concept before you finalize. And here's what's really important. Once you've developed the plan and executed the plan, you're not done. Because for the next drug, uh, that you're going to study for that same disease, maybe it's not a TNF-alpha, maybe it'll be an IL-6 inhibitor, you feed that information back so that you know more. How did the drug behave? How much similarity do you have? Does that change the extrapolation approach for the next drug you're gonna study for that same disease? Or maybe that same drug for the next pediatric indication. So always you should be feeding that information back into the system. Once you develop the extrapolation concept, then the plan should be well identified. In other words, it should just be used to fill gaps in knowledge. What kind of um, methodologies and what kind of trial designs can be used to fill in gaps in knowledge? 
the guidance goes into a, a lot of detail about different methodologies and different uh, modeling approaches that can be used. So I'm not going to go over it here. We'll go over it in, in the setting of the example. So here's the case example. And by the way, this case example is published on the ICH website if you want to take a look. And the slides are directly from the training material slides. So we developed a hypothetical drug, a tumor necrosis factor alpha, or TNF-alpha, which we're calling drug X, for the treatment of polyarticular juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or PJIA. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip over the teaching objectives because you can read them on your own. And there are three caveats here, the f and very important caveats. First, this is not intended to be regulatory guidance about how to develop drugs for PJIA because different regions may have different approaches. This is just intended to illustrate an example of the pediatric extrapolation approach. The other point is, is that, um, that uh, we don't want this to be uh, uh, official regulatory guidance about development of PGIA drugs, or for that matter, official regulatory guidance about pediatric extrapolation. So here's a restating of that framework that I just showed you a, flu a few slides ago. And one way to think about it is that extrapolation is based on three important legs. You can see number one here, disease similarity, number two, drug pharmacology, and number three, response to treatment. That these important, three important legs of the stool, the stool doesn't, can't sit, can't stay upright unless you have all three uh, legs addressed. And that's these three important legs that form the pediatric extrapolation concept. And we'll go over each of these uh, legs of the stool. So the first one here is similarity to disease. And for the example of PJIA, we created a table, which you could consider doing. We created a table of all the clinical features of the disease between the pediatric form, PJIA, and the adult form, rheumatoid arthritis. Now, it turns out they're two different names. But in reviewing the data to support clinical uh, similarities, we noted that actually the biggest difference between PJIA and rheumatoid arthritis is really the age cutoff. So it's largely a similar condition, but called a different name, depending on whether you're a child when you get the disease or whether you're an adult when you get the disease. There are some minor differences here that I might point out. For example, PJIA is, is identified by greater than five joints. And here in adult rheumatoid arthritis, they say multiple joints. Now, that could be five or more. It might not be five or more. Also importantly, are that the treatments that are used for PJIA are the same as the treatments used for RA. So if we look at the clinical features and the pathogenetic features of PGIA versus RA, they seem quite similar, actually. And again, the major difference is that it depends on the age in which you contracted the disease. The next part of the guideline goes over sort of a question-based approach. So how similar are th is the course of the disease? And I just went over that with you. Are there any endpoints or biomarkers that can assess progression? What about short-term and long-term outcomes? What are the available treatments? And how do those treatments affect the course of the disease? Now, as it turns out, if you look at that previous slide, many of these features between RAA and PJIA are quite similar. And so what we've done is this, this table is, a, is, is in uh, the document, in the training materials. And so what we say is we put the Xs where we think, you know, it falls on the spectrum of different to the same. Now, the important point here is that not that X exactly occurs right here. Maybe someone else would have put the X here, or maybe someone would have put the X here. The important point is that it gives you a visual description of how similar you are on that spectrum of different to the same. Okay? So one way to think about it visually is to take those questions and then map them on to this diagram. Now, again, we're not telling you you must do it this way, but we found that this may be a way to help you to understand where the similarities and differences lie. The next pillar, or the next leg on that stool is pharmacology. What do we know about TNF-alpha inhibitors, and how do they differ between um, children and adults? Well, TNF-alpha, you know, we do the review, we look at it, the mechanism uh, of action is to inhibit TNF-alpha. That is very similar in terms of the action between adults and children. And what about those important pharmacologic aspects, the ADME, or the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination? 
very similar. In fact, the most important PK consideration is really that when we've looked at dosing in children, that we use allometric body weight scaling for clearance and volume. And that's a pretty, that tells you that they're probably pretty similar between adults and children. Um, also, the target levels are not intending or not expected to influence PK. So in terms of the pharmacology, we go to the next slide. Um, well, actually, if we go to, let me just do this first, and then we'll go to um, the next, the, the, how we put it together. If we look at similarity of response, how do you measure similarity of response? So you've looked at the pharmacology. Well, TNF-alpha, the mechanism of action, the ADME look very similar. What about TNF-alphas in that disease, in RA versus PJIA? Well, one important factor is that clinical endpoints used to evaluate RA are similar to the clinical endpoints used to evaluate PJIA. So in fact, if we look at previous TNF-alpha programs, the clinical response between children with PJIA and adults with RA is very similar. So that supports that not only are the drug pharmacology similar, but the response to treatment of different TNF-alphas in other programs for PJIA versus RA have a similar exposure response. So if we map out that existing data, remember I told you there are lots of existing data that could exist, different types of existing data. So if we look at similarity of disease, remember those three stools of, uh, three legs of the stool, similarity of disease, the drug pharmacology, and the response to treatment. What types of data do we have? In each of those categories I went through earlier, what types of data do we have to support similarity? Well, for similarity of disease, we have lots of data. Okay, so we have lots of data available. For pharmacology, there are some areas where we maybe don't have a lot of data, but we have data in clinical programs for other TNF-alphas for PGIA and RA, as I mentioned here. So if we look at this table overall, it gives you a sense of, again, from left to right, increasing confidence. There is a lot of existing data here that can help us support the confidence in the similarity of disease and response to treatment in a PJIA for TNF-alpha inhibitors. The next exercise should be an evaluation of the safety data you have and how much data can you use to extrapolate safety. So we know that for the TNF-alpha inhibitor class that they've been used quite widely in both adults and children for different diseases. We also know that in the TNF-alpha inhibitor class, that the adverse reactions, those serious and non-serious adverse reactions, tend to be similar between adults and children. And there are some serious adverse reactions associated with TNF-alphas, including serious infections and development of malignancies. We also know that for TNF-alphas, the long-term safety has been tracked in both children and adults. Um, and that in general, okay, that if you're looking at the very youngest patients who are going to be treated with TNF-alphas for PJIA, those patients down to two to four years of age, that that safety profile doesn't seem to be as different um, when you compare to slightly older children, six to 12 years of age. So you have to think about what age group of patient you're going to be studying in your pediatric program. Okay, so let's think about drug X here then. So we've talked about what we know about TNF-alphas, but what about drug X in PJIA? So I'm going to give you some of this information here for the purposes of the exercise. We are telling you, okay, that we want to study PJIA down to two years of age. So that should already tell you, okay, I've got to think about, um, we're going to go down to two years of age. Does that mean there are going to be different considerations for the safety because we're going down to two years of age? We're not going to stop at adolescence. We're also going to tell you that for drug X, in the program for, R, for adult RA, drug X, it's already it's similar, okay? So we're giving you that information. Now, this may not be information that you know in your own program, but for the sake of this exercise, we're telling you that the available data for drug X is similar in the adult program compared to other TNF-alphas, okay? We don't know what the long-term safety is of drug X, though, either for RA or for PJIA, okay? We don't know that yet because we haven't studied it. We also know, we're telling you, that there are no known off-target effects of drug X, which is similar to other TNF-alphas. Um, and then there are no other non-clinical data. So are the, all of these items here, we put forward for you just for the sake of the exercise. These are things you're going to have to develop in your own programs.
So if we look at the extrapolation of safety, what's the youngest page? We said down uh, age, we said down to two. So you, we put the X here, maybe you might put the X here, but again, toddlers being those patients kind of one to 18 months of age, a little bit older, okay? What is the amount of data that we have? We have clinical data. It's the, in, in the same disease and in different diseases uh, for the TNF-alpha. We know that there are known, as I mentioned, no known off or on target effects. And that, um, you know, what about age-specific data? Do we have that in, the, in this for this particular drug X? And as I mentioned already, we don't know yet about some of the longer-term safety. So there are some unknowns here for the safety of this drug when used in children. And what about the duration? So the duration of treatment for RA and PJ is gonna be the same. These are chronically used drugs. So we know that this is similar. So again, this gives you an idea of how to answer those questions to give you an idea of how similar or different these uh, drugs are in terms of safety. What is the expected exposure between pediatrics? Again, chronically used, so this is similar. The therapeutic or known window, again, we don't know whether or not there are specific therapeutic concerns in children that in a, th in a therapeutic window. This is not known yet because we haven't studied it in children, so we don't know yet. Okay, you might say that, you know, again, is the therapeutic window narrow or wide? For TNF-alphas, we're saying, well, we, we know the therapeutic index for TNF-alphas is, is pretty wide, so we're putting the X here, but that may not be true for other drugs. We don't, we don't have a lot of relevant non-clinical data, but what we have is similar. And then finally, what about other unique factors? All, you know, for the sake of the argument, are similar. But the whole point of this is to map out in your drug program, and for this particular example, what do we know about TNF-alphas related to RA and PJA? And these are, this is just where we're putting the Xs. You might put the Xs in a different place. Once you've done the example of collecting all the information, then you, you say, okay, well, how do I integrate the evidence? This is the last part of the concept. What body of evidence do we have? What are the strengths and limitations of the disease? And what consistency do we have in the data? I want to spend a little bit of time on consistency because this part of the body of evidence and the limitations, that's going to be pretty straightforward. But what we're talking about in terms of consistency of the findings is for other diseases, or for, sorry, for other drugs in the class, for other drugs that have been used for PGIA and RA, have those drugs worked? Let me give you an example where it doesn't work so well. So in the, in the area of, of disease de, uh, drug development for a major depressive disorder, we have a lot of drugs that have been approved in adults, but we've had a lot of failed trials in children. So there's very inconsistent findings between drugs that work in children and drugs that work in adults for a major depressive disorder. In this case, there's a lot of consistency in the findings for TNF-alphas related to adult and pediatric disease. So as we integrate the evidence, what's the body of evidence? The body of evidence so far is that we have a lot of evidence that suggests that the diseases and the response to treatment are similar. And in fact, generally speaking, we have a high level of consistency between the classes of drugs that have already been studied for RA and PGIA. And then finally, do those differences affect my confidence in the similarity? And the answer is no. So it looks like we're talking about an integration of evidence that for TNF-alphas, for the treatment of PJIA, we have a lot of similarity that can build, uh, that we can use to support an extrapolation approach. And this slide is a really busy slide, but this puts it all together. So I want to spend a little bit of time going over this. So we have across the top here, disease, pharmacology, response to treatment, right? Those three legs on the stool, and then safety. And on a, along the columns here, we have the gaps in knowledge. Have we identified gaps in knowledge that need to be filled? Do the gaps in knowledge require additional data before we can finalize the concept? And how will these gaps in knowledge be addressed in the extrapolation plan? So we've identified no real important gaps in knowledge in the pharmacology or the disease. We know there's a gap in knowledge in the, in the response to treatment because we don't know what the dose is yet that we need to study in children, right? So we know there might be a response to treatment in adults, but we don't know what the response to treatment will be in children. So we know that's a gap in knowledge. And we also know that there's a gap in knowledge related to the long-term safety of this drug, drug X, when we use it in children. 
Now, when we say NA here, if we have no gaps in knowledge, then there's really no reason to go further. That's why we put NA here. If we know there's no gaps in knowledge in terms of about the disease similarity or the drug pharmacology, then there's no reason to address this in the plan, okay, or address it to gain more information. And in fact, since there's no gaps in knowledge, or sorry, there's no additional gaps in knowledge that we need to do before we finalize a plan, that means we can go from here to here, okay? And similarly, from here to here, okay? So the plan, if you think about it, is we know what the gap in knowledge is. We don't know what the dose is in children. So what we have to do in the plan is address that dose. And how do we do that? We can collect PK data. We don't have all the safety we need, so how do we do that? We've got to collect some safety data in children as part of the plan. And so here's the presentation of the concept. Well, I'm going to skip over this because we've already talked about it. So we have high similarity in a nutshell. We have high confidence, and therefore, maybe we can use a PK matching approach. So that's, again, visually depicting what we've just come up with based on a review of the data. And what does the plan look like then? The plan looks like, as I mentioned, PK matching. So if we're going to do a PK matching approach, this is where you need your clinical pharmacologist to help you. And I am not a clinical pharmacologist. I'm a pediatrician by training. So I'm not going to go into great detail about what the plan would be. But suffice to say, the plan might be we could use some modeling and simul simulation approaches to figure out what kind of doses we want to target in that pediatric study. And that the target metric that we're going to use to assess exposure, again, has to be associated with something that we know relates to efficacy or safety. The number of patients that we'll study in this PK matching approach will have to be based on the variability, the precision of the estimates, the validation of whatever um, exposure matching endpoint you're going to use. And then um, certainly there are some times issues related to feasibility in terms of the justification for the sample size. But this PK matching approach should look very familiar to you if you've done phase two studies. This is a very similar approach to how you might uh, uh, assess a dose exposure response that you might want to take into a phase three trial. And then finally, we do, we do go into uh, some graphical representations that we want you to consider in, in putting together this PK matching approach. Um, in addition to uh, extrapolation uh, using the PK matching, what data do we need in the plan to collect safety? Well, remember we said that we know that we have some confidence that um, the adults have already been treated with drug X um, and that PGIA have been treated with other TNF alphas, and it looks like the data in the adults is pretty similar. But we need to confirm the long-term safety and the short-term safety of this new drug in patients with PGIA. And so there would be potentially a plan to collect safety data in those patients you're already studying in the PK study, and that you may need to collect um, or should plan to collect longer-term safety as part of a surveillance approach, maybe long-term post-approval. So I hope to have in these 30, 35 minutes or so given you an idea, a flavor for how to use the pediatric extrapolation guideline to create your own uh, pediatric extrapolation approach, your own concept and plan based on the information that's in the new guideline. It's available, and actually we just closed the comment period a couple of weeks ago, and the E11A working group is meeting starting on Sunday to review the comments that we've received. Uh, over 1,100 comments we've received from around the globe, so we do have quite a bit of work to do in addressing those comments. So in summary, what I've hoped to present to you in the last 30, uh, 35 minutes is that pediatric extrapolation is a very important strategy to minimize the data package that you will need to collect in a pediatric drug development approach if you can rely on adult or reference population data that have already been collected. And it, it depends very, very much on the confidence you have on the similarity of the disease between that adult population and the pediatric population, and how similar that drug and the response to treatment are between that adult and pediatric population. It is definitely not intended to be a cookbook that I just plug in numbers and I come up with an answer. You can see, and I hope to have shown you, that where that X occurs on that continuum can be different depending on who you're talking to. And the the 
the art of developing a program here is trying to figure out where those gaps in knowledge lie and how much data that you have, where that X will lie. Uh, once you've developed a concept, then we are encouraging uh, developers to use innovative approaches to address those gaps in knowledge, including adaptive designs, including uh, modeling and simulation approaches to um, hopefully create a plan that will fill those gaps in knowledge. And that I hope that you take the time in the next uh, few days, weeks, or months to review that case example so that when you are faced with your own pediatric development program, you can make maximal use of this guideline in your own development programs. I want to acknowledge all of the regions that are participating in the expert working group, and I want to thank you for attention.